Hey hi everyone, so how I've ended up making this video is uh, leading up to Christmas I had a guest stay with me who turned out to be an online dating expert. Well, she'd written thousands of pieces for the media and she dropped the names of a few online dating sites that she thought were good so I checked them out and what I found is that some of these dating sites they have personality uh, questionnaires that you fill in and then they match you by your responses. Uh, uh, some of people on these sites talk about themselves. They, they talk about themselves as being easygoing, funny, intelligent, articulate, romantic, hey, and even kinky. Uh, but what did the questionnaires say about them? Um, so this is a case when we can use exploratory factor analysis. So the idea, what we can use it for is um, I've got measurements. It come from, can be from questionnaires or uh, or may not be from questionnaires but let's focus on questionnaires because a lot of newbies will be using it for questionnaires I think. Um, so these questions are there to probe aspects of people's personality and the questions otherwise known as items uh, will be uh, interrelated some of them okay so you could have some of them can, can be concerning intelligence some of them can, can, can be concerning about um, degree of romanticism and so on. Uh, so you've got loads and loads of questions. What factor analysis can do then is summarize those loads and loads of questions in, the two, in a few factors. So a factor, I've given you some examples, a factor from this questionnaire, personality questionnaire, it could be like intelligence or, or degree of um, articulateness and stuff like that, right? Um, so that's what it can do. So uh, summarizing uh, lots and lots of uh, questions by a few factors which uh, can represent the kind of uh, interrelatedness or correlation among these items. Once we've got the factor, these factors we can create what are called the estimated factor scores for each of the attributes like degree of uh, intelligence, degree of being funny, romantic and so on. Um, so we can classify people by you know degrees of these kind of traits. So that's one use, and I think that would be the major use for uh, newbies. Uh, we can then take those scores and uh, just do a summary of stats of those, like report the mean standard deviation, do plots, or we could also take them to do another uh, other other types of uh, deeper analysis, such as regression or ANOVA. Um, that's not the only use of uh, factor analysis. We can use it to validate a scale. We can use it to check the unidimensionality of a scale which is necessary for running uh, Cronbach Alpha. All right, but I'm not really concerned with those other things I've just mentioned, which is to me just lots and lots of jargon. I'm really focusing on uh, finding these factors and then you can then use these factors to do whatever you wish. When you're reading around, you're gonna find that there are two types of factor analysis. There's exploratory and confirmatory. We are gonna focus on explo exploratory. Um, I'm not going to just, I don't need to spell out what these types of things are. I'm just telling you so that when you're reading around, uh, forget anything that's talking about confirmatory factor analysis uh, for the purpose of this video, which is on exploratory factor analysis. Okay, uh, another th reason really why I put off this vid making this video on EFA is because it's kind of a lot of murky, murky things about it. Uh, lot of grey issues, uh, areas that are, are vague. It's, sometimes it's a bit like playing with tarot cards. You get what you want, um, especially how some people teach it. So, but being newbies, uh, we want, like, we'd appreciate uh, like a recipe, you know, steps, simple steps that we can follow to kind of um, steer as clear of all these murky th things. So steps is what I'm going to discuss next. And then finally, I'm going to do an example uh, of the EFA on personality data. Okay, the steps. Here's like my flowchart, which I know some of you appreciate. So, just like with all other kinds of, some other kinds of uh, analysis, we have conditions and assumptions that we need to kind of check first, okay? Um, if I don't tell you about these assumptions or the more important ones, it's a bit like selling you a dodgy car, all right? I, I just show you the good bits. I don't tell you about the faulty bits. So while we're together, the car might be fine, but when you go off and drive off, 
you might find that it doesn't start. So um, I don't feel like I can tell you about FA, EFA without telling you a bit about the assumptions. Uh, otherwise I'm a bad salesman, aren't I? So the classical um, exploratory factor analysis is based on, if we still think about the questionnaires, is that your variables, they are uh, normally, they're continuous and normally distributed, or could you say normally distributed, jointly normally distributed, because that implies that they must be continuous. Obviously with questionnaire data, it's not going to be like that. We're going to have mixtures of, could be continuous, we could have ordinal, because we could have Likert scales, um, could it have nominal as well. Um, now if you look around the literature, uh, the statisticians will tell you you cannot apply EFA uh, as SPSS does it with ordinal and nominal data. Um, but if you read outside the stats literature like uh, psychologists, how they use it, they'll just say this is where we pretend the ordinal uh, are continuous. Okay. Mm. So being newbies, let's accept that. But if you're going to do a more kind of serious analysis, uh, just know that if you're going to treat ordinal as if it were continuous, then you are likely to over, uh, you are likely to come up with come up with more factors than actually are present. So if you bear that in mind, then even if you have ordinal, you, you can kind of just cut down on the factors or kind of just a bit more cautious about choosing more factors, okay? Because you know that if you use Likert scales, uh, you could come up with more, likely to come up with more factors than actually there. And this has been shown in simulations, okay? Nominal, uh, nominal, so this is like where the variables, uh, the level of measurement, they, they, they have no ordering. Um, if it's just like yes or no answers, um, uh, what called binary or dichotomous, um, that's accepted, okay? Uh, but not if it's like on uh, more than two uh, uh, more than two levels. Uh, so, for example, um, religious uh, belief, um, Christian, Christian, uh, I don't know, uh, Buddhism. You know, it's a bad example. Uh, and another one, okay. So three, um, then uh, this wouldn't work. Um, there are ways around that, but for a newbie, um, just know that. Uh, Hopefully that you've you've set it up so you're not you only got continuous and ordinal, all right? Uh, maybe nominal if it's just two categories. All right. So then the next thing we do is we also have to know that factor analysis is a large sample kind of procedure. So you've got to have, and this is where uh, you get different numbers depending on who's teaching it to you. Some say minimum of fifty. Uh, respondents or what we call cases. Okay, so in other words, 50 people have responded to the questionnaire. Some people say at least you want 100, all right? I guess it really, the number really depends on how many factors you're going to try to get out of the thing. But just say we want lots and lots, just know that we want our sample size to be large. Um, the other thing is that we've got to have enough questions as well to make up these uh, factors. So uh, again, depending on what you read around, some people say uh, if you expect, you should have like five, three to five variables m minimum for per factor. So if you expect there to be a factor measuring degree of um, trust that somebody has in a partner, you, you'd hopefully you'd have at least minimum of three to five questions relating to trust. So it's really how you are constructing your questionnaire here. You know, you've, you've got some hypotheses, you've got some you know, these factors in your head. So you got to make sure you've got enough questions. Uh, concerning those factors. Okay, and then uh, and then there are a couple more um, couple more um, conditions that we're just going to come across and we'll look at SPSS. Right, the next step, we can go, safely go to the next step, is that determine the number of factors. Right, so we want really to have, the whole point is we're supposed to kind of reduce these uh, number of uh, items to be represented by a few number of factors. So if we've got like uh, um, 50 questions, we're not after 50 factors, all right? Because that's not, we haven't reduced anything. Uh, well, I might want to kind of have those 50 questions, 50 items reduced down to say um, like four or five or three, something very small number of factors, okay? Which those factors should carry some kind of meanings, which relates to um, a set of questions in your questionnaire. So 
Once we've determined a number of factors, the next step is to rotate, right? Uh, this thing called rotate, just jargon at the moment. The whole point of rotating is to get a sharper distinction between the factors, meaning that uh, I want to be a clearer distinction that this set of questions is about degree of intelligence, this other set of questions is about the degree of somebody's uh, sportiness or something, or how they're extra, you know, degree of being extrovert. Um, Okay, then flowing down this chart, uh, what happens next is we drop the poor factors, i.e. Uh, poor factor meaning uh, maybe it's got poor interpretation, doesn't really have a clear interpretation of what the thing means or there's not enough, it's not related to enough questions. Like, you know, as I said, we need to three to five questions per factor. If we had look, like only one question for that factor, it's pointless keeping that factor. Um, and also we tend to drop variables that are, are kind of associated, loaded with more than one factor, what they call them, um, cross, uh, what do they call it, cross, um, cross loading or something? Yep, cross loading. Uh, I am not an expert on factor analysis by the way, okay? So, um, a good point about that is that I'm asking simple kinds of simple questions that hopefully you'd be asking, okay? Uh, you can see that the, this factor analysis is a cyclical in nature, so once we've dropped if we had to drop anything, we kind of cycle back and we re-estimate with, with the same number of factors um, and then we rotate again and just see what we get. Okay, once we're happy with that, that means we've got the result and at this stage uh, your, your, your teacher just might stop and then you're thinking, why has he just stopped? You know, what's the point of done, doing factor analysis? Um, so once you've actually gone through there, then you're going to Next obvious step to do for newbies is go ahead now and calculate or estimate these estimates of the factor score. So estimate of their degree of intelligence, estimate of their degree of trustworthiness, all this kind of stuff. Um, if we are moving on to try to calculate the Cronbach Alpha, we, 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 have, we have kind of verified the unidimensionalness of the, this uh, of the scale, uh, or we could have also we could have validated uh, the scale, as in meaning that um, we've kind of check that all the questions are measuring what they're supposed to measure. Okay, already that sounds like long enough. So let's jump straight into the application. So I've got the personality data here. Um, okay, I did not go online and gather up all this data from a dating website. It, it's just, uh, I've got a date, um, personality questionnaire. It has, it has it has uh, 44 questions, and let me just delete this because this is like something I did before I started. Uh, 44 questions. And how many respondents? Okay, that's well over 100. That's 459. So cool, I can run this thing. Uh, except for we note this, that the variables, all these variables, they are uh, on the Likert scale. Uh, I know that they are all ordinal. I've got no nominal. I've got no continuous. Uh, so basically, this means that if I'm going to run it on in SPSS uh, standard SPSS uh, packages, then I am likely to overestimate the number of factors. All right, which I might say that in my report to kind of um, show my supervisor that I've been reading around. I actually, know something more than books actually usually tell you. So. Next thing is determine the number of uh, factors. Right, before I s go into this, let's just assume this because there's so many buttons that, and options that you can use in EFA. Uh, we're just going to assume that all the roads lead to the same place, okay? Uh, if we just bear in mind that at the end of the day, what we want as newbies is something factors that are interpretable then we're not don't care which of these kind of buttons we're pressing okay because uh, depending who you're taught by some professors have some kind of liking for some methods rather than others and I'll kind of point them out as we're going along but if you're on your own and you haven't kind of been taught FA and you're using it for your dissertation just kind of bear in mind that so long as we get some kind of you get some result that is meaningful uh, then you don't need to spell out exactly how you got there, right? They'll just be happy with the factors that you end up with at the end of the day, okay? Because if you don't bear that in mind, it's like you've got all, you're going to get anxious about pressing all these buttons. What do these buttons do? You know, what do they mean? And that's pointless. You don't need it. Okay, so we'll go to analyze. 
and it's a dimension reduction method because that's so that's what this so we'll go down to dimension reduction and it's factor that we click okay uh, I'm gonna have to reset this because I did it before you want to take select the variables and push them over into the variables box now all these come from the same questionnaire I'm putting them all in okay then what um, assumptions um, we we'll go up to descriptives and I just click on KMO and Bartlett's test of sphericity okay so they give you two things that we can check for and use used uh, in practice okay to um, get initial number of factors we need to click on extraction so that's extract the number uh, the factors uh, we've got a choice of method and now uh, this is like where it's like God, it's down. It's up to you. It's up to you. Statisticians, if we click on this, prefer apparently the uh, maximum likelihood method, ML, uh, and principal components. Whereas, say, social scientists, they tend to talk about using weighted, uh, using least squares or uh, principal axis factoring. Uh, and uh, so, do psychologists. Uh, well, there are assumptions for these things depending on which one you use. So, like for maximum likelihood, it kind of assumes that uh, it assumes like uh, joint normality, all right? Which for Likert scales is, I mean, uh, joint normality of the factors. Uh, which, um, if you're doing Likert, if you've got Likert scales, you you might say, well, maybe not, okay, or maybe yes. But if we bear in mind that so long as we get an okay result, uh, we don't care what we're going to use. So let's just use something, all right? So maybe we're going to use. Uh, Principal factor and principal actus factoring. Um, analyze. Um, most people have it on correlation matrix. They analyze the correlation matrix, i.e., pick out the factors uh, from the correlation matrix. Uh, so we're going to stick with that. Uh, so don't go for covariance matrix. If you go for covariance matrix, the method for finding the number of um, determining the number of factors, as I'm going to show you. Uh, is not going to work. So just leave it on correlation matrix. Display unrotated factor solution. Leave that checked. This thing called the scree plot. Mm, most people check it, so I'm going to just check it. All right. It's not great, but we're going to check it. Uh, extract based on eigenvalue. We'll leave that at one, and continue. And for now, uh, that's what we need. So let's just click OK. We we'll start off with this box that we we asked for the KMO and the Bartlett test. Uh, this KMO uh, is, uh, is a number. It's a number that measures the proportion of variance in the variables that might be explained by underlying factors. Uh, so it's, it's a proportion, it must mean it's value between 0 and 1. So closer it is to 1, the better. And this is 0.841. Uh, now some books say bigger than 0.6 is fine for social science. Some say bigger than 0.7. We are we are high, all right? So that's good. That's basically saying that uh, uh, a lot about 84% uh, of the variability in the variables can be explained by um, some factors underlying factors uh, that is not a test that is just a number next thing Bartlett is a test okay being a test it must have a null and an alternative the null is basically that there is no correlation among the questions um, do we reject that go to p-value which is sig yep we're, we want that to be less than not less than 0.05 uh, this is tiny, so good it means that there is structure there. Uh, there are factors that we can pull out. Uh, there are interrelated questions. Okay, then I'm going to go down to the total variance explain box, and there are two, uh, three columns: all with initial eigenvalues, the factor in one, eigen, initial eigenvalues in another, and extraction sum of squares loading. Uh, all we need to do because we want to avoid any kind of we're not doing a deep kind of analysis here. We want to go straight into this second column extraction because this tells you the number of factors that have been pulled out, and you can show that the working is like from this side. Okay, so we can, that's what I'm saying. You can ignore that because uh, we just want the results. So if we look down here, we just go down to the bottom number and go along 10. So we've got 10 factors from this 44 question, 44 numbers of question. Yeah, look, if we go down to the bottom table, 44, that's like 44, uh, we had 44 questions, has been reduced down to uh, 10 things. So those 10 things helped us, will summarize, hopefully most 
uh, of the variability in 44 questions. Now, how did I end up with 10? You know, this is where because uh, we told uh, SPSS um, to 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 base it on eigenvalues, uh, the factors with eigenvalues bigger than one. So that's what it's done. Uh, so if you slide along here, that says where it's tenth one. It says 1.044. That's bigger than one. That's why you've got a number there. So it's taken it across to this side. Whereas the next one, do we need 11 factor? Well, that eigenvalue there is 0.966. It is less than one. Hence, it's gone, and that's it. Now, if you look at the scree plot, it's basically a uh, a plot on the x-axis of the factors running from 1 to 44, uh, plotted by the eigenvalues. Okay. So so long as you know that, you already know that if we're basing it on eigenvalues bigger than one. To, to say it's a factor, then you don't need the scree plot, right? So scree plot is just an alternative, but some people like to look at something visually. Uh, so we can look at that, okay? But just know that, that, that they're slightly, uh, they're just, the scree plot is just showing you what you've already just seen. But So if you decided on the on the one criteria, stick to that. Um, because the scree plot is not always clear what you do. The way they teach it is like they say, suppose that is a kink, uh, or they like to use the word elbow, where that kink uh, is, uh, then that's the cutoff. But if we determined that the eigenvalue is 1, that was a cutoff there, then we would select whatever is that number. Okay? So, uh, I mean, you could just put this in a report and just say you've based it on eigenvalue bigger than 1. Those two are not the only ways, but they're the most popular ways of determining the number of factors. Okay, so let's say we stick with 10. Um, so now we want to kind of want to see if there's a mean, uh, uh, get a more interpretable meaning of these 10 factors and usually this is where we just rotate. Uh, so if we go to analyze again and we go to uh, dimension reduction factor, this time go to rotate. All right, okay, the, uh, like how many options are there? One, two, three, three for five options. The most widely used ones are either Varimax or uh, or pro max, all right. And the distinction between the two is that the very max one um, says that the factors, our ten factors, are, um, are orthogonal to each other, whereas the pro max says that our factors can be correlated to each other. So orthogonal means like they're independent of each other, have nothing to do with each other. Whereas the pro max says that our factors. Uh, for example, in our case, it could be, I don't know, intelligence and being funny could be like correlated, right? If if intelligence came out to be a factor and funny came out to be a factor. Uh, so, some people have to just say go for pro max because why do we assume uh, orthogonality when um, when that's a very strict thing? Basically, orthogonality uh, in maths is very nice because it leads to kind of neat results. So, let's just go for pro max. But again, if you bear in mind that doesn't matter what we do, so long as we're going to get something that's interpretable, then we're fine. Okay, uh, and we say okay. Now, just to make the output clearer, easy to interpret on the on the on the, on, on the factors, uh, we go to options and we go down here where it says uh, coefficient display format, and we go sorted by size, suppress small coefficients. Suppress small coefficients just mean. Uh, delete or just do not sh uh, show uh, those, um, uh, I don't want to use the word loadings, but I'm going to have to, I, loadings that are below a certain value and what they tell you in textbooks or stuff is 0.3, right? So we want, don't want anything below 0.3, so we want something meaningful in other words, we don't want it too small. Uh, and Okay, uh, missing values, we're just going to, if you have missing values uh, in your data set, which in reality people do, we're just going to just leave it on default, exclude uh, cases list wise. Okay. And then we're going to go. Okay. Right. Cool. What you see here, and this is where, if you look at my first, what we've got here is we've got a factor, we've got a pattern matrix, structure matrix, and a factor correlation. Uh, the factor. The pattern matrix shows us what are called the loadings. Uh, now, these loadings, I'll show you what we're going to... This loadings is what people report. The structure matrix reports the correlation between the variables and our 10 factors. Okay, and then you've got the factor correlation matrix, which shows you, like, the correlation among our 10 factors. 
So let's go to the pattern because that's what we're really interested. Uh, so we've got our questions going down on the, on the first column and then we've got these other things going on, uh, one for each factor. And here's the thing we're trying to interpret these factors. We've got 10 factors, let's look at them. So let's go to the tenth one because I, I want to see like now I want to see if I can kind of chop anything out because we are down here. Do I drop all factors variables that are loaded more than one factor? That kind of thing. Let's go part way to doing this. So for the tenth, let's just have a flip down. One, two, three. I count three items with that. Okay, only three, right? So that one's only got three. Uh, so we might say that's we might want to chop that out. How about the ninth factor? How many questions are related to that? Remember, we're after like minimum of three to five. Uh, well, that's got one, two, three, four, and eighth one. It's only got three as well. Okay. Uh, well, knowing that we're dealing with Likert scales, ordinal data, we're likely to have overestimated. So why don't I just chop it? Uh, go straight down to. Okay, seven has got seven, our seventh factor has got one two three four five cool so we could keep that why don't I go straight to seven so in other words I have dropped the poor factors because the last three don't I'm, I'm gonna just say look they don't have enough uh, they're not loaded onto enough um, items so let's let's just do that we're gonna go down again to so you can see, analyze factor and now we're going to go to extraction and we don't need the screen plot so so we don't get cluttered with so much rubbish on our screen let's get rid of that uh, let's get rid of that as well and rotate it we don't because we're not interested in any of that stuff we want to fix number of factors now I said we're going to drop 8, 9, and 10 I? so that means we only need 7 factors I'm telling 7 extract only 7 and we'll go OK and we don't want to touch anything else OK so because uh, we still want it rotated and say OK. And then we want to go down to the pattern matrix again. All right, you see now it's got seven columns. Factor seven. Let's look at. Well, my seventh one has gone down, is still three. And my six has got three, four, five questions. So I'm going to cut one more, OK? Um, I'm going to go analyze dimension reduction factor you can argue with me by the way with what I'm doing because I'm no expert at this but extraction 6 but I'm going to come up with something that's meaningful ok and then continue and ok pattern matrix click that's the fast way to do it 6 let's see 6 1 2 3 4 5 ok I'm more satisfied with that now so let's see if we can do some interpretation let's look at the first one first factor, uh, the adjectives here, disorganized, it's got a minus. Uh, minus means that it's basically the opposite of this. So if this was a, uh, in other words, if it's minus, it means that the more, ah, uh, let me just re rewind, right? This is what I had a hard time finding. You should know this is that the pattern matrix show you the loadings. The loadings take values between minus 1 to plus 1 because when I'm saying small or big how the heck do you know what is small and what is big if you don't know what the minimum value and the maximum values are if there are any so I'm telling you that the minimum value is minus 1 and the maximum value is plus 1 now this is minus 0.75 it is not a correlation it's a loading okay but this minus 0.75 is closer to minus 1 than it is to 0 isn't it so it must mean it's quite negative related that's what this uh, sign means. So when you look at each of these, what called the loadings here, you look at the sign, which tells you uh, it's like correlation. It's like which is is it is it kind of um, positively or negatively related, and then the magnitude. Uh, so I'm just interested in the sign at the moment. Um, the sign is negative, so it kind of means that this factor is to do with more organized person because the more negative is that means that actually the more opposite is of this adjective so it's not this person's organized okay that this fact is to do organized there um, the second one is positive does a thorough job okay so it means that it does a thorough job efficient if efficient okay that's a positive one negative one careless so it must be the opposite of that, that means this fact is to do with something that's being more careful uh, lazy that's a negative one that means again opposite of this so it's per person that is not lazy um, Perseveres, it's positive. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, reliable, yep. So sticks the plan, 
positive. So all anything else? No. So altogether, we've got to kind of think of one adjective or one phrase that some you know what is this factor measuring? Um, well, is it measuring his degree of? Well, first of all, it's like positive quality, isn't it, in somebody? Uh, you wouldn't use the word niceness to do that, isn't it? So you want to find one adjective that summarizes everything that I've just said there. Uh, well, how about just all round good goodness? <laughs> um, you can probably think of something more more kind of succinct, but this this the thing with uh, fact analysis is uh, you got to come up with these phrases. Okay. Um, one thing to say, well, I've got pluses and negatives. Is yeah, it's because see some of these questions is like oppos is how you phrased it. So if you wanted all to be positive instead of positive and negatives, especially when you come to calculate. Uh, these factor scores, you are going to have to kind of recode it, uh, opposite code this so that this is talking about being degree of organizedness, all right, instead of being degree of degree of disorganized. And then you can see that the next one, I'm going to do something one more time. So second factor, it's positive and it's quiet. So it's positively related to quietness. It's positively related to the reservedness. Positively related to shyness. It's negative related to talkativeness. That means it must be positively related to not talkativeness. All right, if that's a word. And negatively correlated to outgoing. So positive must mean uh, negative must mean it's uh, the opposite, the degree of uh, not outgoingness. So this could all be like as oh, a character like uh, introvertness, isn't it? Basically, like me. Um, uh, and this one here. Oh, nervousness. Okay, and so on. Um, so if we go back to our flowchart, we've dropped the poor factors. We haven't dropped any variables, and I'm not going to do it, but I'm just going to show you something. We want to get rid of things like nervous, um, not because we don't like the word. It's because it's related to more than one factor. Okay, so we don't want that. Factor two and three both contain nervousness. So that's called cross-loading. Uh, we don't want that. Uh, in this case, it's also the factors are not unidimensional. Okay. So I have determined the number of factors. I've rotated them to kind of get a sharper image of these uh, interpretability of these factors. Uh, although I don't I did two for you there, but you can see what I was doing. Uh, I've dropped the poor factors, and I've told you how to drop the, the, the poor variables. Da da da, with more than one factor, and then we re-estimated, and yep, and we've got something that say we're happy with now with six factors. Now 44 questions down can be represented by six factors that have a, each have a meaning. And now we can do the following. We can estimate the factor scores. We can estimate the factor scores. Now, yeah, I know that newbies like to do this because once you've got the factor scores, then you can compute the factors like the degree of um, introvertness, okay, and then report that or um, calculate the mean and standard deviation of that. Uh, okay, that's good, which is good. Yep, it's good. So let's go over to, to this thing here. There's nothing to do with kinkiness here. Okay, well, this question has nothing to do with romanticness or anything. Oh, it's not not uh, it's not very comprehensive. Uh, it's not a very comprehensive um, qu a questionnaire on personality, is it? So, say we want to create a score because we've got these six uh, factors. Um, well, well, um, uh, one thing you can do is I did it in another video. Is you simply take these questions relate to, like for the first factor you want to measure one number for each person that summarizes their that measures their degree of um, say the second one uh, of their degree of introvertness you will add up their score of quietness reservedness shyness uh, shyness now talkativeness you're going to have to reverse code uh, so not talkativeness and then otherwise you got get all these signs to be the same outgoing and you've got to kind of reverse that as well so it's talking about not degree of not outgoingness all right so in other words, that they're all talking like in the same direction, then you can add them up. Uh, that's one way to do it, which I've shown you in another video how to do. Um, another way uh, that that gives you the unit weighted, what they call the unit weighted uh, scale or score. So what other way we could do is we can use um, a weighted scale, uh, and and um, we can do that in various ways. So let's go down to dimension reduction factor. And this is where you see scores. Now, again, I'm going to again I've got more than one option here. I'm just going to bear in mind that 
we just want to score. All right, there's three methods, regression, Bartlett, Anderson, Rubin. Just note that for all of them, um, the calculate score so that on the average score is zero. So if somebody is gets a score above zero, it means they're above average. If it's negative, it means that they're below average. All right. Uh, if you want the clear distinction between them, click on help button, which will tell you the uh, tell you more about the differences between these three. Um, but the main thing to note is that the they're calculated so that the mean values are zero. Okay. Uh, let's continue. What's going to happen now? It's going to, should create. It will create uh, an additional column for each of our factors with the score. All right. Here we go. Uh, and if you look down here, yes. Look. Can you see? One, two, three, four, five, six. Aha. Uh -huh. So yeah, I did six, not seven, right? So yeah. So six. View. So remember the second one was to do degree of introvertness, wasn't it? So degree of uh, introversion. Um, so if we look at factor two, and why don't we even give it uh, a proper name here? So it's revision introvert, introvertness, uh, introvert, introvert. Okay, just say introvert. Uh, let's uh, click on this again to take us over here at introvert. So the first guy, first person, First person got a score of on the introvert scale of minus 0.157. That is negative. That means it is a less introvert, all right? Because the more positive it is that means the more introvert. So it's less introvert than average because zero is the average. Okay, the next person 1.23. That's above average. Now this is like where the web dating sites like for each person, like for this person here, second person will have like I don't know a bar chart. You know, it's a good way to show it, isn't it? A bar chart uh, showing you like their score for each one of these so that the kind of like taller the bar for, for that particular fact that means the more you are of that thing. Uh, easy for non mathematicians to interpret. Uh, so I think that's that that's it really. Um I tried to make this really clear. Uh, I've given you kind of like a, a recipe um like this for something to follow. Uh, I've told you kind of very emphasize this thing about the conditions and assumptions, which is often kind of just not mentioned or just skipped completely. But it's uh, it's actually uh, very funda very very important. So just know that because uh, if we're doing qu uh, questionnaires, we have ordinal, um, probably ordinal. Then um, we are going to if we could use SPSS, we are likely to overestimate the number of factors. Uh, SPSS does have an add-on, a module called what is it called? Capture or something like that? Uh, categorical PCA that uh, deals with categorical, i.e. these two guys, uh, the dichotomous and um, ordinal uh, uh, questions, but I think you have to pay for it. So, hey, I'm not going to pay for that um, because other software like Stata, M plus already have that built in, right? So, I mean, something like that should be so standard now. Um, or you could use R as well, which is free. So if you are kind of more serious, uh, doing serious research, uh, um, you, you kind of want to kind of, lead, you know, you use like, you you will kind of use methods which kind of recognize the deficiencies in, um, in, the, in, the, in the standard method. So if you've got categorical variables like you do in a, in a, in a questionnaire, you, you want to be using um, some package that kind of takes account of the fact right rather than just assuming that they're continuous as we have done in this uh, using this SPSS uh, package okay well uh, you can write lo loads of comments I don't know uh, I'll be interested in reading what your, your thoughts are okay cheers guys and uh, good luck with your dissertation